Good evening. Well, it is five past six, so I think we should make a start. Um, and welcome to you all for the Douglas Johnson Memorial Lecture. I believe that this is the 14th lecture uh, in the series, um, set up by the Society for the Study of French History, of which I'm uh, currently president. I'm Penny Roberts from the University of Warwick. I should probably have started there. Um, in association with the Association um, for the Study of, of Modern and Contemporary France, and um, Douglas Johnson, who was a professor at UCL, distinguished um, French historian who uh, was involved very closely with both societies. So it's appropriate that um, we uh, honor his, his memory at this occasion each year. Um, so welcome, and without further ado, I shall pass you over into the capable hands of Professor Daniel Power from the University of Swansea to introduce our speaker this evening. <coughs> Thank you very much, Penny. Um, well, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Amy Livingstone, who is head of the School of Humanities and Heritage at the University of Lincoln, a post that she has held since the beginning of 2022. Professor Livingstone was previously head of history at Wittenberg University, Ohio, and then associate dean and professor of history at Ball State University in Indiana. She's also a life member of Clare College, Cambridge, and was a recipient of a teaching award from the Medieval Academy of America. Professor Livingstone is renowned for her publications concerning the aristocracy of medieval France, especially women, the nature of aristocratic power, and family networks. Her many publications include Out of Love for My Kin, Aristocratic Family Life in the Lands of the Loire, 1000 to 1200, which was published by Cornell University Press in 2010 and Medieval Lives, circa 1000 to 1292, The World of the Beaugency Family, published by Routledge in 2018. Her recent move across the Atlantic to Lincoln is therefore very welcome to the community of scholars of French history in the United Kingdom and Ireland. And it is fitting that she should be the first medieval historian to give the Douglas Johnson Lecture. Her subject today draws upon her current research concerning Ermengarde of Anjou, Countess of Brittany, and is entitled Adventures in the French Archives, Finding Countess Ermengarde of Brittany, circa 1070 to 1147. A vous la, la parole. Okay. I was going to say that step is not made for people who are under six feet tall. Um, sorry? All good? Okay, I'm gonna start my stopwatch to make sure I don't go over. Um, well, first of all, let me thank Dan and uh, the members of the Society for the Study of French History and the Association for the Study of Modern and Contemporary France for this lovely invitation. Uh, it's great to be here. I have never been in this building before, so it's, it's really special. And uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight. So tonight, I am going to spend some time talking about my favorite topic, uh, Countess Ermengarde of Brittany. And today, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to talk about how I went about finding her, and also ask the question, why did she need to be found? As well as spending a little time talking about Ermengarde and how she should be integrated into the narrative of 11th and 12th century France. So we'll start with that. So every historian, Oops, I remember, sorry. I know I should point at this thing, but it worked, yay. Uh, every historian of the aristocracy has to have a genealogical chart. So it's just, it's de rigueur, one must have one. And I imagine many of you don't know who Umengard was, so I thought it might be helpful just to place her. And as you can see, she comes from a very broad kinship network. She's related to some rather important people. Uh, her father, let's see if I can find the pointer. There we go, here we have Ermengarde. Her father was a count, Count Fouclarachin of Anjou. Uh, she is married to another count, uh, our good friend, Count Alan of Brittany. She's mother to a third count, Conan III. Uh, and she's also descended from a rather impressive family of lords, the Lords of Beaugency, and also related to some royalty. As we can see, King Henry II of England is her great nephew, and her brother, Folk, half-brother, Folk V of Anjou, goes on to become the king of Jerusalem. So clearly this is a woman of considerable social status uh, and a fairly extensive kinship and social network. 
So that's who she was, but where was she? Uh, sort of the, uh, how do you find Ermengarde? Uh, and obviously, this is sort of the, the orbit in which she operates. So pretty much the western part of uh, the Loire Valley, as well as much of Brittany. And we'll talk more about her sort of geographic fixation uh, later in the talk tonight. But I thought it would be useful for you just to have a geographic uh, position for Ermengard, uh, who, oops, go back, let's see. Oh, good heavens. Come on, I really fast forwarded, didn't I? There we go. It's hard to find the pointer. Okay, so she's born here in Angers, and then when she becomes the Countess of Brittany, her uh, residence changes. She spends much of her time in Rennes and down here in Nantes, just to sort of give you a geographic fixation there. So that's where she is, but what did she do and why is she interesting? So I thought I would just give you a very bare bones introduction to Ermengarde and her life and give you an idea of why I find her such a fascinating topic. So Ermengarde is born about 1070. She's born in Angers uh, to her father, Count fouquet and her mother, Ermengarde of Beaugency. She spends her youth in Angers. Uh, her mother dies when she's quite young, about seven, and she spends her time at her father's court and being educated at the Abbey of Laurent Serret uh, in Angers. In 1093, she marries Count Alan the, uh, of Brittany and then obviously moves west uh, to Brittany to become the Countess of Brittany. While Alan goes on crusade uh, in 1096 to 1101, Ermengarde rules Brittany uh, pretty much on her own with some assistance and support from her brother-in-law and her sister-in-law. And I will mention that while she's doing this, she has three children under the age of seven. So if any of you out there have uh, <laughs> dealt with children under the age of seven, you can imagine this is a woman who knew how to multitask. Uh, she also inevitably had servants to help her as well, but clearly she has a lot on her plate. After her, Alan comes home in 1101, Ermengarde becomes more interested in leading a religious life and in 1104, she decides to become a nun at the Abbey of Fontevraud, which is perhaps the best known or certainly um, one of the most prestigious abbeys uh, in medieval France. And she becomes a nun there for about two years. In 1106, events compel her back to being Countess of Brittany. And she's Countess of Brittany and ruling with her husband, Alan, until his retirement in 1112 to the Abbey of Redon at which point their younger son, Conan, becomes count and Ermengarde co-rules with him pretty much until, well, just until the end of her life. So she is an active countess helping to rule Brittany from 1093 to 1147. Interestingly, Conan only lives another six months after his mother. So pretty much his whole life, uh, he was count. When he was count, he has his mother uh, as his co-ruler or I don't know, mommy dearest, uh, to help him uh, with the ruling. In 1130, 1131, Ermengarde again becomes very interested in religion and becomes a nun once again, uh, this time at a Cistercian convent in Burgundy at Loray. She's there for about a year, and it doesn't really suit her. So she leaves and decides to travel to the Holy Land to visit her brother, uh, King Folk of Jerusalem. And she's there for, from about oh, 1131 to 1134. We know she's back in Brittany uh, in mid-1134 because she's making donations. And she remains in France from that time forward. Uh, she continues to help Conan rule uh, Brittany, but she also is involved in reforming the church and sponsoring different ecclesiastical communities. So hopefully this very bare bones overview gives you an idea of why she's such an interesting topic and why I am engaged with writing her life. Now, one of the questions I often get is, how did I find Ermengarde? Well, I found her because I was looking for her mother. Uh, her mother, Ermengarde of Beaugency, married the Count of, of Anjou, so I thought when I was writing this book, shameless self-promotion. Uh, when I was writing this book, I wanted to find out more about Fulcleresheim's wife. So I did what people do, and I Googled her. And unfortunately, I didn't find anything out about Ermengarde's mother, but I got a whole paragraph on Ermengarde. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. 
I've never heard of this woman. Why haven't I heard of this woman? There must be things written about her. So I went out to search for Ermengarde to see what had been done, because I thought she'd be another facet to, to integrate into this book, and found that pretty much there'd been a handful of articles written about her in the 19th century, uh, and a few things, a few articles written about the men that she knew, uh, particularly some very prominent medieval clergy, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, um, Robert of Avricel. Uh, she knew these men very well, and she is mentioned in discussions of them. But there wasn't really anything on Ermengarde, with the exception of a biography written by a Breton psychologist. Uh, who psychoanalyzed her regard, and we'll just leave it at that. Uh, so there really hadn't been anything done. And that seemed to me rather curious, simply because she was related to so many interesting people, did so many interesting things. So why was Ermengarde missing? And I think there are two things going on here, one of which has been the attitude or the assumptions that scholars have made about medieval women. And I've given a couple of rather juicy quotes uh, from Georges Duby, who I'm sure will be familiar to many of you, the noted and extremely talented medieval historian. But he clearly had a view about medieval women. They were silent, he couldn't hear them, they were strictly subordinated. So when the sort of, you know, master says this about medieval women, uh, it does sort of discourage people from uh, further examination. On top of that, you know, so we have this attitude that, you know, women just aren't important to the narrative of medieval past. On top of that, Ermengarde herself has not been treated very kindly by historians. Uh, Jules de Petigny calls her a flighty woman who did not know her own mind. And then we have Arlette Le Bigre, uh, who somewhat nicely says she's the only political male in 12th century Brittany. But the fact that she has to be male in order to rule is somewhat problematic. And then Jacques Delarron, another very prominent and important medievalist um, currently working uh, in France, refers to Ermengarde and the women of Fontevraud as social rejects. So combining all this together, one can appreciate why uh, maybe Ermengarde has not merited the attention that she so richly deserves. So we're going to just take care of that. I've been waiting my whole career to do that. Uh, right. So, one of the challenges, of course, as we all know, is you can come up with great topics in history, right? But if there aren't any sources, you're out of luck. And I thought, well, maybe the reason why no one's written about Ermengarde is there's nothing to find out about Ermengarde. There are no sources. Well, as you can see from these letters written to her by prominent medieval clergy, there clearly are sources about Ermengarde out there. Uh, and you know, these are some fairly influential individuals uh, who are writing to her. Regrettably, none of her letters survive, except, well, I have one letter in her voice. Uh, and it's really the only document I have in her voice, which I think highlights some of the challenges of doing medieval women's history, which is we have to rely on sources written by people who weren't interested in women's experience, uh, and in some ways were hostile to women. Um, some medieval clergy can say some pretty misogynistic things about medieval women. So it's very challenging, and you have to really sift through these sources to sort of farm out uh, the rich and interesting tidbits of these women's lives, and then hopeful, uh, hopefully stringing them together. So it is a challenge. And I'm pleased to say, right, we know we have letters to Ermengarde, but there are other sources that can be very useful in putting together her life. And the backbone of my study of Ermengarde, my biography, I hesitate to call it a biography because you know, I don't know the exact date of her birth. I don't know a lot of the personal details. I don't have her voice. So I prefer to talk about writing a life uh, because of, of those constraints. But the backbone of my study is going to be a document, Medieval Charters. And I know that there's some other charterholics in here with me. Uh, Dan is very familiar with these sources, as are some of the members of our audience. Uh, charters are a wonderful source. And they're essentially a document that records the transfer of property, usually from uh, an aristocrat to the church, a donation that's made, or a transfer of property between two ecclesiastical communities. Uh, they're basically property transfers. 
But unlike modern documents, they're rather chatty, and they have some lovely details that you can then pull out uh, about people's lives, not just women, but obviously aristocratic men, their retinues, clergy, monasteries. They're, they're really lovely sources. And as you can see, these are two very small little documents. The one up at the top corner is an 11th century uh, charter, and some of them have some holes in them. Uh, and the little crosses are the signatures of the people who are involved in the donation. This one, let's see if I can get the right button this time, um, has a tag down here which indicates there was a seal attached to this at some point. But these are single sheet charters and they can be mined for all sorts of interesting information. They also come in various shapes and sizes. Uh, this is a rather large document where you have to sort of play the game of Twister. Is that a reference everybody gets? Okay. I didn't know if that was an Americanism. But, you know, basically one elbow on one corner, a foot on the other, and you try to read it and transcribe at the same time, which is why digital photography is so wonderful, uh, because you can, you know, actually read it without having to contort yourself. So these documents come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And I thought I would just give you an example of some of the information that you can find in a charter. And this is a donation uh, from 1106 to the Abbey of Fontevco uh, by Ermengarde and her family. So usually a charter will start with saying, you know, who's getting the gift and who's making the gift. So here we have Ermengarde and her family. And then it will often say, you know, why they made the gift or what they get in return. And in this case, as we can see, the nuns are going to pray for them uh, until the day of judgment. So clearly there's a, a relationship between the donation and then securing spiritual prayers. And then the next, and we could also find out where the grant was made in Nantes in the Commodal Hall, who was there with them, two very important women from Fontevraud. And then there's usually a list of witnesses. And those witness lists can be wonderful because they will flesh out some family relationships. They will tell you who's in the retinue, who's where. So one way of charting uh, literally Ermengarde's life and her trail is by seeing where she is in particular times uh, in issuing these documents. So charters are the backbone to my source, and they are a particular source that we you know, refer to as documents of practice because they capture what happened at the moment. They're not prescriptive, they're not imaginary, they're not idealized, pretty much. Uh, they are sort of at the time uh, capturing the practice of the time, which makes them a very useful uh, source for putting together medieval lives. Now, of course, where do you find these things? Um, and I'm sure some of these images will be familiar to many of you in the audience. Uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris has a lovely collection, not so much of charters from Brittany, but of copies of charters from Brittany made in the modern period. And here we have a slide of the Salle de Manuscrit, where I've spent many a happy day. Uh, and I know some of the rest of you have probably been there as well. And in addition to Paris, uh, the regional or the departmental archives are very useful. And as we know, France is divided into de département, and they are responsible for their patrimony. Hence, they collect the documents relating to their history. And I've been to the one in Brittany, here at Rennes, uh, but also Nantes, um, but also Angers, because, of course, that's where Ermengarde's family uh, originated from. I'm going to pause and let people sit and get a glass of water. The other, oh, sorry, I need back the microphone. Uh, the other place that I have uh, been able to spend a great deal of time before the cyber attack, uh, which I know we all mourn, uh, is the British Library. And you may be wondering, why would a historian of medieval Brittany be at the British Library? Well. The British Library is home to the only 12th century cartulary from medieval Brittany. Now, a cartulary is related to a charter. It is essentially a codex or a book where a monastery or a nunnery at a particular point in its history decides to collate and record and organize their single sheet charters. They may do this by geography, they may do it chronologically, but it basically, it's a book that contains charters. Uh, many of them are obviously copied sometime after the original donation, but the only 12th century cartulary from Brittany that is extant is in the British Library. And it's the Cartulary of saint croix of It is a very quotidian little document, 
As you can see, it's been well used, well worn. <laughs> it's you know, document of practice, so they practice with it. And uh, it's small, it's probably about that big. And it's not, in, not a pretty thing at all. It's kind of homely, which makes me love it even more. Uh, there's no fancy calligraphy, there are no illuminations, there's no gold leaf, it's just basically parchment with a little bit of red here and there in the rubrics. Um, but it's a very simple document. But it's a very valuable document because it's the only 12th century cartulary that's survived from Brittany. So texts are obviously going to be important to writing the life of Ermengarde. So things like letters, things like charters, but also references in historical chronicles help to sort of weave together her life. The other thing that's very useful are objects. And as historians, right, we've started to the material turn uh, and know that objects can be really useful in understanding the way societies worked, their values, their connections to one another. And this doc, this beautiful staff, which is in the treasury at Angers, uh, helped me to really understand Ermengarde's role in a donation made by her father at his deathbed. It really revealed the important role that she played and the performative nature of charters. So objects can be incredibly useful, excuse me, <coughs> as well. You can tell I'm an administrator now because I don't have my you know, teaching chops uh, and able to talk nonstop for a long period of time. Oh dear. Anyway, uh, the other thing that's been very useful is looking at landscape and geography and topography. So I read, write a charter saying that Ermengarde had helped to found this beautiful church uh, just north of Rennes at saint sulpice la forêt but I had no idea how big it was, right? Uh, and so being able to visit and look at the space, understand the landscape around it, understand the, the topography of Brittany uh, and its relationship to the western portions of Angers has been, or Anjou has been extremely helpful. So using all of this material, I am trying to put it all together to write the life of Countess Ermengarde. Okay, so now we're gonna to turn to some actual history uh, about Ermengarde. And as you can see from the uh, overview of her life, there's some color coding going on here, uh, purple and red. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of my time this evening is to talk to you about Ermengarde in relation to two questions. Two questions that have been very much a part of the historiography of medieval women. One of them is the question, could women rule? Did they have the power to rule, to command, to judge? My argument for Ermengarde, this will be a huge surprise, uh, is yes, in fact, she did have the ability to rule, command, and to judge. So we'll be looking at that particular theme, the one that's in red. The one in purple, is about Ermengarde's relationship with the clergy and the church. The sort of dominant narrative about women and medieval clergy, medieval women and medieval clergy, for many years had been that it was a hostile relationship, right? That the men convinced of the superiority of their sex really didn't have much use for medieval women. And of course, when you read some of this stuff, it does appear that way. But if you push beyond the rhetoric, if you push beyond uh, sort of the, the monastic um, rhetoric, uh, you find that there's a little bit more to the story. And by exploring the relationships between aristocratic women and specific medieval clergy, we get a very different picture. And I would argue in terms of these two themes of ruler being a ruler, but also being um, recognized as important by the medieval clergy, that really what we're talking about is Ermengarde as a partner, both to her husband as a ruler and her son, but also to uh, members of the medieval clergy. So that's where we're going to go. Um, we will start with Ermengarde as a ruler. Here we have delightful, imaginative portraits of Ermengarde and Allen uh, that were executed by an early modern historian of Brittany, uh, Dom Labineau. Uh, I don't think this is what Ermengarde looked like. As many of you, I'm sure, know, we don't have portraits of medieval people. Uh, but I, I like to show them anyway because they're fun. Uh, and here we have Ermengarde and her husband, Allen. Ermengarde spent pretty much the first half of the, 20, of the 12th century ruling Brittany, first with her husband and then with her son. When we look at the decrees issued by Allen as a count and the sort of co commonal chancery or the commonal dis um, 
dissemination of regulations and law and settling disputes, in 87% of those documents, Ermengarde appears. So she's obviously a very important member of the Commodore family uh, and helping Alan to co-rule Brittany. And remember, between 1104 and 1106, those two years, she's a nun. So for it's a fairly high percentage, I would say a very high and persuasive percentage, that Ermengarde is taking part in communal politics. And indeed, the charters describe Ermengarde and Alan as uh, ruling comitalitaire, right, committally, uh, together as counts. And so she's certainly um, vested with many of the same powers that would go along with being count. One of the interesting dimensions of the history of Brittany in the 12th century is that the communal, communal priorities shift. For much of the 11th century, the focus had been to the west, right? Looking west into the Breton Peninsula. When Alan marries Ermengarde, let me see if I can get, yep, there we go. Uh, we find that the communal gaze, the, the priorities of the communal family of Brittany shift significantly. They shift east, and they shift to Anjou and Loire Valley. And the reason for this is Ermengarde. She was married to Alan for a very specific reason. Alan wanted her as a wife for her networks and her social standing, her family relationships, her connections to uh, powerful monasteries like the one here, it's kind of at the edge of the map, Marmoutier, uh, which her family had been associated with for generations. And so Ermengarde becomes very much a part of the fabric of comital rulership, and the gaze of the counts moves towards the east. And this has to do with Ermengarde. The other thing that's interesting is that Scholars often characterize early 12th century Brittany as the time of when it's sort of the county got its act together. Uh, they finally had, you know, they were issuing decrees, they had kind of sort of a chancery, uh, and things just seemed to be running a little bit more, for lack of a better term, sort of professionally or efficiently. And of course, you know, the person who's at the helm for the first 47 years of the 12th century uh, is in fact Ermengarde. So clearly, right, there is this shift in the priorities of the Counts of Brittany uh, towards the east. And they become very interested in what's going on in Anjou, uh, but also the connections up towards um, the royal family as well. There's another element to this, too, that sort of reinforces the focus shifting towards the east, and that has to do with cultural and linguistic differences in Brittany. The eastern part of Brittany, and here where Ermengarde and Alan are spending most of their time, I should say, uh, I've been working on charting Ermengarde's life, and I have yet to find her acting on this side of the line, except once, one time between 10, 1093 and 1147. So her area of focus, her area of authority, is in the eastern portions of Pays de Rennes and Pays Nantes. Alan, before he marries, Ermengarde spends much of his time up in the western portions here. And as you can see, there is this linguistic divide here. Uh, eastern portions of Brittany are Francophone, western portions speak Breton, which is a Celtic language. Ermengarde did not speak Breton. I can't, I'm 99.9% .9 sure she did not speak Breton. She was definitely a child of the Loire Valley. Alan may have been the last count of Brittany who spoke Breton. So we can see this sort of shift in alliances. So you're probably thinking, well, what is it that Ermengarde did as a ruler? Well, as we can see from the quote from Robert of Arbrissel, who writes this letter to Ermengarde, she obviously has the ability to command. And she appears with Alan in holding courts, issuing decrees, uh, dealing with disputes. And one of the roles that she plays is as intercessor. So, for example, uh, Alan became very angry with one of his vassals who had made a donation to the Abbey of saint -Médard. The monks, excuse me, the canons are very concerned um, because the vassal had made a donation to their community and now Alan is preventing the, the property from transferring to them. So the canons approach Ermengarde, their friend, uh, to help with the situation. And Ermengarde is able to persuade Alan that this is a good thing and that he should let the gift go. And he does. 
And this is just one example of the many times that she plays this role as sort of peacekeeper uh, and trying to negotiate uh, a situation to come to a resolution. And clearly this was something that she was quite good at because, small pause, In 11, okay, so Alan retires to the Abbey of Redon in 1112. And Ermengarde and Alan have a decision to make about who's going to take over for Alan as count. The person who was sort of next in line would have been their son, Conan, who was not young. I mean, well, he was young, but he wasn't an infant. He wasn't seven. He was 19. But his parents didn't feel he was quite ready to assume the mantle of leadership. So Ermengarde is placed as sort of a regent with him. And Conan refers to her as his mother and his lord, an indication, right, that she is this sort of supervisory role over Conan. And to be honest, their, <laughs> their concern was well placed because in 1117, uh, Conan does something rather stupid. <laughs> not so fine a point on it, uh, he and a bunch of his um, friends, his sort of cohort, his knights, ride onto the lands of the Abbey of saint of Comperlay, where they do violence to the monks and to the property. The Abbot of saint of Comperlay is understandably upset, and so he escalates the problem through the sort of channels. So he writes to his bishop, the bishop writes to the archbishop, the archbishop writes to the papal legate, the pope's representative in France, and even goes all the way up to the pope. So clearly this was a big problem. Now, so we've got Conan in a rather difficult situation. Now, how are we gonna solve this problem? Well, who are you gonna call? Not Ghostbusters, ha. Huh. Um, maybe that's a too old of a reference, I don't know. Uh, not going to call Ghostbusters, but who are you going to call? Well, Ermengarde. Ermengarde is asked by the papal legate to come in and create peace between the two monasteries. Now, the important thing to recognize here is that this is just not monks having a disagreement over some property. These two abbeys have clients, a circle of clients and donors and patrons. And if this escalates, those two circles of influence could come to violence with one another. They would take the side of the particular monastery, and this could result in civil discord, civil war, uh, a whole lot of trouble. So this isn't just sorting something out between two sort of cranky sets of monks. This is something that has significant political um, power to cause disruption and un instability in Brittany and in Western France. So the papal legate writes to Ermengarde and Ermengarde writes back. And this is the one thing I have in her voice. It's the letter uh, that she writes back to um, Gerard, uh, who is the legate. Uh, he's also the Bishop of Angoulême. And as you can see, right, she writes back to him. And not only does she say, yes, you know, I'm happy to take on this responsibility of brokering peace between these two families, or these two monasteries. But if I do that for you, will you do this for me? And she says, if it pleases you, right, my son's really, really sorry for what he did, so maybe we could lift this sentence of excommunication and interdiction that has been placed upon him. Because having a count uh, who's excommunicated is a difficult thing and certainly undermines their authority in some pretty significant ways. So Ermengarde is successful at brokering peace between these two monasteries. And let me just you know, reiterate here, right? the Pope's representative in France goes to Ermengarde to ask her for her help. Right? That tells us that she has reputation, that she's respected, and that she has the authority and the power to sort of bring these people together and hammer out a resolution. So I think this is testament to the role that she plays in Brittany and the overall respect that she commands from the medieval clergy. Okay. And just to sort of reiterate that point, when we look at the letters written to Ermengarde, uh, describing her by these medieval clergy, you'll see things like powerful and eloquence, shrewd in counsel. 
So clearly her power for eloquence was useful uh, in settling this dispute. And our friend Jeffrey of Vendome says, in your earthly rule, as I have heard, exercising the laws of justice and making peace. Very similar to what she's doing, uh, obviously, between these two abbeys. And then, our, uh, again, Robert Vabricel, do not command anything lightly. Right? So clearly, these verbs tell us something about what it is Ermengarde is able to do and the influence that she commands. So when we think about can women rule? Can women have power? Uh, clearly, our friends on the clergy think she could. And this is backed up by the actual roles and events and the things that Ermengarde does as countess, uh, including being an intercessor, but also uh, helping to create and ensure the stability that had uh, existed in Brittany for several decades is maintained, and we don't have basically civil war uh, as people line up on either side of these monasteries. So this sense tells us Ermengarde is a partner to her husband, to her son, maybe more than a partner to her son, um, maybe more of a, I'm not sure their relationship was quite equal, but clearly she is a person of considerable influence. And this is also connected to her relationship with medieval clergy. So turning to our second question, our second issue about medieval women's experience, right, what's their relationship with clergy? Well, Marbot of Rennes, uh, who's the Bishop of Rennes and was actually appointed just uh, three years after Ermengarde becomes Countess, was a very good friend of Ermengarde's and I believe he owes his ecclesiastical position to her influence, wrote very positive things about Ermengarde. But in his other writing, you can see the sort of inherent difficulty of trying to untangle this problem, right? In one part of the Liber, uh, was it the Liber Decum Capitulorum, he says, in all things received from God, nothing's better than a good woman. And then in a later chapter, he says, woman, the unhappy source, the evil root. So how do you square those? Same text, same person. Uh, right? Well, I think, again, we need to look beyond the rhetoric and look at the relationships uh, that existed between medieval women, uh, particularly women in the aristocracy, and the clergy. Now, as I've mentioned, Ermengarde is a woman of profound faith and piety. Remember, she becomes a nun, nun twice in her life. First at Fontevraud here, uh, but then uh, a Cistercian nun at the Abbey of Loray in Burgundy. Twice she left the cloister. And the assumption has always been, well, if you left the cloister, you were a pariah. No one would want to have anything to do with you. Yet, after she leaves the cloister, her relationship with Robert of Arpicel and uh, Bernard of Clairvaux very friendly, very supportive, very affectionate. So the founders of these institutions that she left clearly didn't have, didn't see her as a pariah or someone that um, was worthy of their scorn. Rather, they see her as a partner. And I'll talk a little bit about how that is executed um, in, during Ermengarde's lifetime. So how does she become a partner to Robert and how does she become a partner to St. Bernard of Clairvaux? Here we have a letter, an excerpt from a letter that Robert wrote to Ermengarde around 1112. So this was, what, uh, six years after she left the cloister. And this is Robert's description of the church in Brittany. As you can see, he doesn't think much of it, right? Uh, there are a bunch of barbarians. Um, they, nobody speaks good, nobody does good, nobody knows God's law, nobody knows the truth, right? Clearly, he sees the Breton church in a state of tremendous disarray. And interestingly enough, Robert himself is from Brittany. So in a way, he's pretty well acquainted what's going on in the church in Brittany. In this letter to, to Ermengarde, he writes to her and enlists her support for helping reform the church and to sort of sort out some of the problems right, that he lists here. And he enlists, he basically asks her to help uh, in reforming the church that in fact, you know, it really is her duty as countess. To be honest, Ermengarde didn't need much encouragement, right? Remember, she's a pretty pious individual. But also, uh, during Ermengarde's lifetime, the church was undergoing a period of reform. We often call this the Gregorian Reform Movement. And at the heart of the Gregorian Reform Movement was the idea that the church, particularly monasteries, had become corrupt and too much under the influence of secular rulers. 
So the sort of main gist of this reform movement was to find ways to pull the church away from the secular world and to prevent secular people from having an influence. For example, right, uh, dukes buying ecclesiastical offices for their sons who can't read Latin. Uh, another example is the fact that many of the aristocracy built churches on their patrimony, uh, controlled these churches, controlled these ties through much of the 11th century. And the church is not happy with that. Right? This is ecclesiastical property. It belongs to the church. So one of the ways that people express their dedication to reform, their understanding of reform, is by restoring ecclesiastical property to the church. And Ermengarde and her husband, Alan, do this quite frequently. In fact, they gave two churches that they controlled within Nantes and Rennes to the Abbey of Marmoutier. And this is significant because Marmoutier was the, the seedbed, the fountainhead of reform in the western part of France. So even before 1112, when Robert is writing to Ermengarde to enlist her help in reforming the church in Brittany, she and her husband have already signaled that they understand the precepts and they are supportive. Another element of this reform movement is how are you going to get people to know about what the church wants to do in terms of reforming its practice? Well, one of the venues for this were church councils that would be held in local areas. The local clergy would come, there would be discussions, they would issue decrees about what certain practices were going to be stopped, what certain practices were going to be started. And during Ermengarde's time between 1105 and her death at 1147, seven church councils are held in Brittany. Before her time, there hadn't been one. And for the 50 years after her death, there are only two. So during her lifetime, there's a very concentrated period of an attempt to reform the church. And we know that Ermengarde is present at many of these church councils. So clearly, she is taking a very dynamic and active role in following basically what Robert of Art Purcell has asked her to do, which is to help to reform the Breton church. Another facet of this reform movement has to do with monasteries. There is the perception that monks and nuns have just gotten a little too comfortable, that they are not as ascetic as they should be, that they're living rather swanky lives, uh, times of comfort, and sort of excess. So there are movements to reform monasticism, uh, and there are sort of two elements of this, uh, one of which is Fontevraud itself, which was founded to ensure a very aesthetic, a very rigorous religious life, one that got rid of some of the creature comforts that it's perceived that nuns and monks are enjoying. And Robert of Arbrissel is one of the, the major proponents of this monastic reform. Ermengarde signals her support of this by founding a church just north of, Britain, of Rennes in Brittany uh, called saint sulpice la forêt which is a Fontevraudian house. That means it, it operates under the Fontevraudian rule. Uh, and Robert had a, a rule, statutes uh, penned in the early part of the 12th century. So that's one element of the reform uh, that, el that uh, Ermengarde supports is through her support of reform monasticism. And of course, this is done after she's left Fontevraud. Uh, I think part of her reason for founding this church was to commemorate her mentor, Robert Arbrissel, who died in 1116. Additionally, Ermengarde also, when she comes back from the Holy Land in 1134, begins the foundation of a Cistercian house just south of Nantes in Bouzay. And at the same time, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who is sort of the the big representative of Cistercian monasticism uh, and a very important man in the 12th century, uh, prolific writer, very well respected, uh, friends with just about everybody in Western Europe, counted on to help resolve papal schisms, right? So this guy is a, obviously a very powerful and important individual. And Ermengarde signals her support of Cistercian monasticism, which is also a more rigorous form of monasticism. Uh, connected to this sort of larger impulse for church reform that's going on in the first half of the 12th century. 
And we can see, too, that Bernard, uh, like Robert, doesn't seem to have a problem with Ermengarde having left the, the nunnery in 1131. He writes wonderful letters to her, expressing his affection for her. And in 1134, she's back from the Holy Land and getting started on founding this uh, monastery. Bernard comes to Brittany to visit her. And he comes with the explicit purpose of asking her to join him in traveling to Aquitaine, to Aquitaine to help reform the church there, because the church in Aquitaine is in a mess. Uh, there are all sorts of problems. The clergy is corrupt. So many of the things that Robert of Arbicel has to say about the Breton church is true of the church in Aquitaine. Um, consequently, Bernard comes to her and asks her to partner with him in helping to reform this church. So again, we see the theme here of partnership, uh, not so much with, you know, obviously, Alan or Conan, but with members of the medieval clergy which really pushes against this idea of this inherent misogynism and lack of engagement on a very productive level uh, between medieval clergy and medieval aristocratic women. Ermengarde had a lot of clerical friends. They turned to her for advice and for support. Uh, Robert helped, wanted her help in reforming Brittany. Bernard wants her help in uh, reforming uh, Aquitaine. So we see, again, this very strong idea of partnership and friendship going on. Okay, to conclude, I leave you with a little bit more of the poem that Marbois de Vrenne wrote to Ermengarde. It's sort of an epistolary poem. Um, it's a very long poem, so I had to excerpt it out here. Um, I hope that perhaps uh, my comments tonight have convinced you, uh, or at least moved the needle slightly, on whether or not you think aristocratic women had power and could rule, but also that they were productive members of their society, that they had very friendly relations with the uh, medieval clergy. In fact, the medieval clergy needed them in helping them to enact the reform that they so desired. The one thing I do want to sort of leave you with tonight is that Ermengarde is not exceptional. She is uh, one of a cast of women uh, who are doing these things all over Western Europe. In fact, I would say, you know, obviously the details change between women, but in terms of the things that they're doing, the authority they command, the respect they command, you could write that across countesses and women of um, elite status throughout Western Europe. So she's not exceptional, but she sure is interesting. And I have to say, it's been a real joy getting to share my work with you tonight on Ermengarde uh, and continuing to work on this absolutely fascinating individual. Thank you for your attention.